Chapter 2 When the Trees Walked One morning while I was sitting beside Grandfather on the veranda steps, I noticed the tendril of a creeping vine trailing nearby. As we sat there in the soft sunshine of a North Indian winter, I saw the tendril moving slowly towards Grandfather. Twenty minutes later, it had crossed the step and was touching his feet. There is probably a scientific explanation for the plant's behavior, something to do with light and warmth perhaps, but I like to think it moved across the steps simply because it wanted to be near Grandfather. One always felt like drawing close to him. Sometimes, when I sat myself under a tree, I would feel like drawing close to him. Sometimes, when I sat myself under a tree, I would feel rather lonely but as soon as Grandfather joined me, the garden became a happy place. Grandfather had served many years in the Indian Forest Service and it was natural that he should know trees and like them. On his retirement, he built a bungalow on the outskirts of Dehradun, planting trees all around. Lime, mango, orange and guava, also eucalyptus, jacaranda, and Persian lilacs. In the fertile Dune Valley, plants and trees grew tall and strong. There were other trees in the compound before the house was built, including an old people tree that had forced its way through the walls of an abandoned outhouse, knocking the bricks down with its vigorous growth. People trees are great show-offs. Even when there is no breeze, their broad-chested, slim-waisted leaves will spin like tops determined to attract your attention and invite you into the shade. Grandmother had wanted the people tree cut down, but grandfather had said, let it be, we can always build another outhouse. Grandmother didn't mind trees, but she preferred growing flowers and was constantly ordering catalogs and seeds. Grandfather helped her out with the gardening knot. Because he was crazy about flower gardens, but because he liked watching butterflies and there is only one way to attract butterflies, he said, and that is to grow flowers for them. Grandfather wasn't content with growing trees in our compound. During the rains, he would walk into the jungle beyond the riverbed armed with cuttings and saplings which he would plant in the forest. But no one ever comes here. I had protested the first time we did this. Who's going to see them? See, we're not planting them simply to improve the view, replied Grandfather. We're planting them for the forest and for the animals and birds who live here and need more food and shelter. Of course, men need trees too, he added. To keep the desert away, to attract rain, to prevent the banks of rivers from being washed away, for fruit and flowers, leaf and seed. Yes, for timber too. But men are cutting down trees without replacing them and if we don't plant a few trees ourselves, a time will come when the world will be one great desert. The thought of the world without trees became a sort of nightmare to me and I helped grandfather in his tree planting with greater enthusiasm. And while we went about our work, he taught me a poem by George Morris. Woodman spare that tree. Touch not a single bough. In you that sheltered me. And I will protect it now. One day the trees will move again, said grandfather. They have been standing still for thousands of years, but there was a time they could walk about like people. Then along came an interfering busybody who cast a spell over them, rooting them to one place. But they're always trying to move. See how they reach out with their arms. And some of them, like the banyan tree with its traveling aerial roots, managed to get quite far. We found an island a small rocky island in a dry riverbed. It was one of those riverbeds, so common in the foothills, which were completely dry in summer but flooded during the monsoon season. A small mango tree was growing on the island. If a small tree can grow, yeah, said grandfather, so others can also grow. As soon as the rain set in and while rivers could still be crossed, we set out with a number of tamarind, labanum, and coral tree saplings and cuttings and spent the day planting them on the island. The monsoon season was a time for rambling about. At every turn, there was something new to see. Out of the earth and rock and leafless boughs, the magic touch of the rains had brought life and greenness. 
you could see the broad-leaved vines growing. Plants sprang up in the most unlikely of places. A people tree would take root in the ceiling, a mango seed would sprout on the windowsill. We did not like to remove them, but they have to go if the house was to be kept from falling down. If you want to live in a tree, that's all right by me, said Grandmother Crossley. But I like having a roof over my head and I am not going to have my roof brought down by the jungle. Then the Second World War came and one was sent away to a boarding school. During the holidays, I went to live with my father in Delhi. Meanwhile, my grandparents sold the house and went to England. Two or three years later, I too went to England and was away from India for several years. Some years later, I returned to Dehradun. After visiting the old house, it hadn't changed. Much, I walked out of town the river bed. It was February. As I looked across the dry watercourse, my eye was immediately caught by the spectacular red blooms of the coral blossom. In contrast with the dry riverbed, the island was a small green paradise. When I went up to the trees, I noticed that some squirrels were living in them and a coil. A crow pheasant challenged me with a mellow who are you, who are you? But the trees seemed to know me, they whispered among themselves and beckoned me nearer. And looking around I noticed that other smaller trees, wild plants and grasses, had sprung up under their protection. Yes, the trees we had planted long ago had multiplied. They were walking again. In one small corner of the world, grandfather's dream had come true. Show a young man happily looking at the lush green forest with lots of wild plants and trees, squirrels and birds. 